unfamiliar, but hopefully uh, they will be familiar the next time. Uh, welcome to our next event will be a uh, series Russian Culture at Hunter, and it's my great pleasure to have the poet and professor Parina Barskova here, our author and her translator Catherine Chipiela, uh, who is also a professor at Amherst College. So these are our guests from Massachusetts. Um, if uh, just a few words about the series once again, uh, if you have not been receiving our emails and if, if, if you want to receive them, simply put your emails on the list over there and you will be getting them if you want to. Uh, we will have many more coming in the next few, in, in the very near future. So in a week from now there will be another poet from Moscow, Maria Stepanova. And then in nine days uh, there will be a concert slash film screening uh, with a live performance by Psoi Karolenko at Lang Recital Hall, uh, which hasn't been announced yet, but it will be as soon as this event is over. Um, it will be on the 6th of November. Um, what we will do today, uh, first of all, this event is related to uh, our curriculum. I'm very glad to see some of the students here who made it and even brought friends, as I see. <laughs> Um, because we just discussed uh, the topic of the siege and read a few texts about it and watched a film by Jessica Gorter. Uh, what we will do today is uh, Paulina will first read a few poems with uh, Catherine's translations of them into English and for those you have the handouts. Uh, then there will be another portion of reading uh, which will be prose again with translations by Catherine and then we will open the discussion about the translation. Uh, our main question to discuss is how do we translate texts about uh, this topic into a language that has never had this uh, type of experience uh, engraved upon it. This is just one of the topics, of course, we can expand and uh, hopefully we'll come up with other questions, not less important. So let me join me in welcoming Paulina and Catherine to Hunter once again and uh, thank you so much uh, for coming to meet uh, with uh, me and Catherine thank you Yasha so I think since this is a, almost a good uh, class size for a seminar um, and this is what we do rather often these days, teaching seminars on translation, workshops. Uh, I uh, really appreciate how Yasha formulated the question. Um, given that the original question, question in the original would be how one writes this kind of experience which is um, problematic enough and I am always happy, or at least I pretend to be happy, uh, to answer all kinds of questions about it. And at some point, uh, happy or not, I think that many of these questions really help one in this kind of work. But then there is a counterpart, how one translates this kind of material. Uh, so, without long delay, uh, we'll start reading. I'll read in Russian, and you'll start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I also had a little statement I wanted to make at the beginning. Um, so I was also very grateful to um, Professor Klotz for uh, the way, he, the question he asked, which I actually only encountered when I finally read the announcement for the event. But it really made me think differently about, um, uh, about this matter of translation. And it reminded me of a statement by Joseph Brodsky, who of course um, he worked on, um, who said in less than one, made the statement about the difference between Russian and English, so it speaks to issue, even though it, he's not, strictly speaking, talking about translation. He said, 
I regret the fact that such an advanced notion of evil, as happens to be in the possession of Russians, has been denied entry into consciousness on the grounds of having a convoluted syntax. One wonders how many of us can recall a plain speaking evil that crosses the threshold saying, hi, I'm evil, how are you? So that last sentence would be American syntax, right? Direct, simple, as opposed to a Russian convoluted syntax. Um, this matter of syntax is going to matter, especially when we talk about Polina's prose, and I think it matters this way. Um, Brodsky is suggesting, and this is something, of course, we can talk about, is suggesting that having had the kind of historical experience that Yasha mentions, the siege experience, and more broadly, the whole experience of the Soviet um, regime, the Soviet era, um, is expressed in a, a complicated, indirect way, that there's a struggle to speak about, right? Um, the language is somehow implicated or saturated by that historical experience. Um, he is, of course, not the first to talk about this. One critical take on this problem uh, it was articulated by the conceptualists who were taking that language and trying to sort of simplify it to display its essential emptiness. So that would be a sort of minimalist approach to thinking about this, um, this matter of, uh, uh, in, uh, I guess, a compromised Russian language. It seems to me that what Polina is doing is the opposite, in a way. The way she approaches this matter of um, a language suffused with uh, trouble, with trauma, or evil in Brodsky's language, um, is to dive into it, is actually to explore the language as it has been used by a range of people historically. How were they speaking about the experience? Um, and this, uh, this is linked, of course, to her research on the siege. When I sp speak about historical voices, I'm speaking about the materials Polina has been studying. Um, diaries from the siege, various kinds of testimonials, various kinds of documentary evidence. This kind of thinking creates a new kind of poem. It created a new kind of poem, certainly for Polina, a poem that is really about languages. Maybe not even so much about voices, but languages. Um, she is representing in her poems different languages, and again, I believe it's part of an attempt to explore how we speak, how can we speak about historical trauma. Um, I've also had some experience translating Svetayeva, and I think that's also relevant to this uh, problem of how you represent, how you translate such a complicated kind of discourse as, Svetaya, as I'm sorry, Polina is creating poems now. Um, I think something similar happened with Svetaiva around the time of the revolution when she started uh, listening to history um, and bringing different voices into her lyric poems, um, sort of breaking them open to include all of these other social voices. Another thing that to me links what they're doing is that uh, Svetayeva doesn't aspire to objectivity, um, although she does aspire, I think, to even-handedness. I see something similar in Polina, that there is a certain tone, um, a tone that I might describe as sardonic, that is very important to capture in these poems, these siege poems. Um, both Svetaeva and Barskova are allergic to hypocrisy, and they are merciless when they encounter it. And again, this seems like something that you must capture when you're translating um, this material. So uh, our, our plan was to 
read two of these vocal performances or two poems from this cycle, which is the best example of what I'm describing, which is the uh, Leningrad Directory of Writers at the Front. Um, so we chose two poems, um, which I, uh, Kalina will read and preface, I guess. Right. So um, you have at the moment in front of you uh, two texts, um, which are part of the cycle, and uh, it's another connected conversation question, what is a cycle, what is a cycle of poems, uh, which might be a rather curious question. Uh, it's something to start this conversation, it is something organized, coherent in some way. And uh, the, again, the most as if naive attempt to say what kind of coherence we're talking about would be to say that uh, it's connected to the title, uh, which is Spravochnik Leningradskich Pisatili Frontovikov. 1941-1945, Leningrad Directory of Writers at the Front, 1941-1945. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, uh, and I will uh, reiterate, um, it happened so that uh, my research is dedicated to the culture of the besieged city, Leningrad underwent the longest siege in the modern military history, uh, 854 days. It's important and strange because on every monument in Leningrad you'll find 900 days, and this is how the documentary is called, but actually it's less. And there is something that irks me about this desire to make the number more round since everybody in the city, believe you me, was counting days uh, with certain precision. Um, so, uh, or as uh, several people attempted to call the published diaries almost three years. So almost three years, Leningrad, the second largest city in Soviet Union, uh, was cut off rudely speaking, from the rest of the country. The rest of the country got the name of the big land, and Leningrad became small land, I guess. Uh, and during the first uh, seasons, first two seasons of the situation, uh, the city basically uh, was left with very little food, Right, uh, basically no electricity. This in a way is enough at least to start this conversation, uh, though there were other situations of radical famine in Soviet history. Some people argue that Leningrad and the siege was not the most disastrous, since we have both Ukrainian and Kazakh Holodomors and still we don't know how, and we will never know how many people died. Uh, but Leningrad uh, occupies a rather remarkable place in this list of uh, disasters for a number of reasons. Uh, for example, because it was really very well described. It's a storied disaster, so to say. And that's where interesting part of this conversation begins, and this is where one would say this text is about. The poet, generously quoted by Catherine, uh, liked to ask a question I could, uh, after a poem. So what this poem is about? What is this poem about? Well, for example, about this very statement, that the siege is, was, has been well described. At some point, when I began my research in the archives of Leningrad, Petersburg, St. Petersburg, 
uh, whatever you prefer. Um, and the word archive is also very important for what we're talking about here. I began finding texts which amazed me, impressed me by their qualities, and I uh, began working on them, and at some point I decided, okay, I'm kind of, I pretend to be a scholar here. I need some kind of scholarly book to help me out, some kind of spravichnik, directory. I want to be directed. There is something very pleasant, right, when somebody directs you. Uh, so I went to Publichka, to the public library in Petersburg, and checked out, I guess. No, I didn't check out. Uh, it's uh, the Spravichna Komnata, so I just looked at it. This very book, Spravichna, Lingradsky Pisatele, where I understood with certain you know, awe that none of the people, writers, but whose diaries I was looking at the moment was mentioned in this Spravichnik. Uh, with one exception, of, obviously, of Olga Bergold, about whom more later. And this uh, difference, if you wish, uh, of the world of information was the first irritant that kind of started me thinking about maybe kind of worlds of the siege description, worlds of the siege writing that were in difference, in relationship of difference towards uh, to each other. Uh, this cycle uh, consists of five texts. Uh, each of them has the same system of titling. Uh, since we decided for certain reasons to give you number two and number three, so basically each of them is titled with the initials of the writer. And then it's kind of difficult to describe what it is. I would say it's a theme uh, or maybe focus something to pay attention to, maybe, when reading this text, when working this text. It's a hint, proposition, suggestion for a reader. For example, text number two is called OB Voice. Uh, again, since we just established that it's nice to be directed, right? maybe you are directed into oral relationship with this text. <coughs> so since there are people, as I understand, for whom... Oh, let's read Russian first and then. Right? I endlessly appreciate that we have students here and courage of studying Russian uh, is indeed courage. And also I want to tell you uh, to share my opinion that poetry is foreign language, whatever. Uh, so listening to poetry, even if it comes through layers of strangeness, it's fine. It's not a useless exercise. Второе. О, Б. Голос. Ангел, но не голубой, алый, алый, комсомол Калили Марлен, с пуритански закушенной нижней губой, с небывалой плотской ясностью скул. Во всем тебе удача. Только разве вот не задача НКВДшник выбивает из-под себя стул, жирная лужа? НКВДшник выбивает из тебя дитя, но и от этого тремола энтузиазма практически не убывает. 15 января. Жирный ледяной туман, стужа, 
ты оставляешь в больнице юного нежеланного мужа умирать и запыхаясь пыхтя тащишься на улицу раково мимо интарных трупов и бирюзовых трупов ах какой художник все это рисовал твой новейший миллионочек допрошает где ты была что бы об этом сказал Барков? Что бы на это ответил Зубов? Ну что ты такая? Ну что это на тебе? Какой бессмысленный машер, искусительный карнавал. Выпуская ледяное яркое жало, ты лобызаешь его, ты погружаешься в микрофон, остраняя сомнения. Не слишком ли быстро сюда бежала, покуда там от до ходил? Он нормально, не слишком быстро. Твой Высоконькой голос проникает туда, куда другое ничто. Сестры, братья мои, дочки, матери, я восхищаюсь вами, насыщаюсь вами, утешаюсь вами, падая, 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 беспокоясь, что это на тебе? Пальто Молчанова. А что у нас под пальто? Number two, OB, voice. An angel, but not a blue one. Scarlet. Scarlet, a compsomol Lily Marlene. Puritanically nipping her lower lip, her cheekbones impossibly luminous. Fortune's favorite. Though there was that one misfortune, the income day agent kicked the chair out from under you, a greasy puddle. The income day agent kicked the child out of you, but even this did not noticeably diminish the tremolo of your enthusiasm. January 15, an oily, icy fog, a freeze. You bid farewell in the hospital to your young, unwanted husband who is dying. And hustling, breathless, you rush to the broadcasting studio on Raqqa, past amber corpses and turquoise corpses. Ah, oh, what artist rendered all this? Your latest heartthrob interrogates. You were aware? What would Saad have said? What would Prince Patsyomkin think? What sort of person are you? And what's that you've got on? Such a meaningless ma chère seduction extravaganza. Extruding a stinger of pure ice, you caress him, cozy up to the mic, dismissing all doubts. Did I race here too fast when there he's departing, arriving for good? No, it's fine, not too fast. Your falsetto voice then arises to join another void. My sisters, my brothers, daughters, mothers, you thrill me, fulfill me, you uplift me when I sink, sink in dismay. What's that you've got on? Molchanov's overcoat. And what have we got underneath? Um, so since uh, this is what is happening, this is the happening, right? Reading uh, in parts. And also since uh, Yasha kind of designated the plan that we are reading texts and talking texts first and then we are discussing. It might be useful if you just write down your questions 
on the margins, or if you notice something that is strange or curious or anything. Um, for example, I uh, did not comment, and uh, I already can predict the first question. And it's a rather uh, simplistic, simple-minded game of sorts, but simple-minded games usually work the best. Uh, the first question every time when I read, and I read this cycle a lot, of course was about initials. Uh, who is the person? Uh, and um, I will be talking about this at some point. Why this? Uh, concealment, if at all. It's wonderful to do this with the sound. It's wonderful to do this with the sounds, especially given the next poem. Uh, because the next poem will be all about sounds. Um, even in a more pronounced way than all bad. That was the voice, and this one is called hearing. So basically, the first one was about the agency of voice. And this one will be about reception. Um, v, v, I, O, M. Slug. Мордастый, щекастый, румяный царевич Входит к слепой Молвия она им говорит Кто ты такой? А еще лучше пропой И он начинает песню о жизни О Кремле, о морячках балтийских, соболебровых О земле пропитанной, подслащенной в шами Слепая вздыхает блаженно, как конь благодарно предает ушами, предрекает, от тебя будет толк, ибо ты нам напишешь блокадную оперету. Он говорит, извините, ослышался. Она говорит, именно, именно, Мася моя. С танцами, плясками, с шутками, прибаутками, С героем-любовником в синем трико, Обтягивающим чудеса, с травести В пионерском галстуке, от экстаза дрожащим. Там все будет, как настоящее, Как в настоящем, но только в жанровой обработке. Он говорит чудеса. Он говорит чудеса. Я готов слушать, слушаться тебя, слепая. Расскажи мне, что ты слышала этой зимой. Слышала шорохи, шорохи, запахи. Засыпая в смерть, слышала деликатное, несъедобное прикосновение крыс. Слышала краски, острую, сдобную вонь. Голубая пахнет, как Михаил Васильевич. Синяя пахнет, как Елена Генриховна. Тень гуро. Насмешнице с овечьим лицом Приходила сюда Я слышала ее торжествующий топоток Город звенел, скрежетал, шептал, щекотал Каток на Илагина В детстве к шкафу Прикручивались коньки 
в шкафу лежала моя безумица мулюшка. Я катала, катала ее по большому проспекту. Там я оставила. Из радиоточки, как мед, как шелк, как рыбий жир на нас текли ари сильвы. Помнишь ли ты? Помню ли я? Помнишь ли ты? Помню ли я? Пусть это был только сон, но какой? Ла-ла-ла. The heavy-jowled, fat-cheeked, red-faced prince pays a call to the blind lady. Speak, says she. What sort of man are you? Better still, make it a song. He cranks up a song about life, about the Kremlin, about the black-browed Baltic sailor boys, about earth soaked, sweetened with lice. The blind lady sighs beatifically, like a grateful horse twitches its ears. She foretells, great things will come of you, for thou shalt write the operetta of the blockade. Excuse me, says he, did I hear you right? She says, yes, yes you did, my darling, with dances and prances, tricks and acrobatics, leading man in blue tights that tug across his marvels, a travesty in a pioneer necklace, necktie, shaking in ecstasy. It will all be like it is now, like reality, but reworked in accordance with the genre. Says he, marvelous, I stand ready to hear a dear blind lady. Tell me then what you heard I heard skitters, skitter smells, and dozing toward death, I felt the inedible, delicate touch of rats. I smelled the sharp, rich stink of colors. Light blue smells like Mikhail Vasilevich. Dark blue like Yelena Gengerhovna. Guro's ghost, a jokester with a face like a sheep's, came here often. I heard her elated stamping. The city boomed, gnashed, whispered, tickled. The ice rink at Alaga when I was little. Skates twisted on the closet door. In the closet lay my crazy Mulyushka. I pushed, she sailed down Bolshoi Prospect, and there I left her. The loudspeaker spilled over us like honey, like silk, like fish oil. Arias from Silva. Do you remember? Do I remember? Do you remember? Do I remember? Yes, it was just a dream. But what a dream. Tra la la. Let's move to what happened next and into a different genre. <laughs> um, right. Uh, so also it should be uh, said that, uh, and I repeat it every time, and it sounds more and more pathetic and more and more meaningful to me, that uh, I spent basically, uh, I think like 10 years, there is something uh, fairy tale -ish. Uh, reading these materials in certain pathological kind of like Pridayu Shami, Blaženstva, of a very particular kind. And I had some kind of contract with myself that I will never write my stuff about it. 
I won't write, which then meant I never will write poetry about this. I will do scholarship and I will publish uh, primary sources. And uh, I was very, I felt good about this. And then of course, somewhat predictably when I read this narrative now, I totally betrayed every promise and broke every oath. And I remember how it happened, just kind of <laughs> in this um, awful physiological way, uh, it began pouring. I began writing first uh, poetry of this, of which this is certain part. Uh, and then I began writing more stuff that after endless conversations with friends and Kathy and critics and readers and people in these classrooms, uh, I, I, I still call non-poetry and I, I do not call prose. Um, and this is a part of this conversation. Uh, I guess that we are having, uh, as we just said, только в жанровой обработке. So the question of genre, uh, when creating some form of language of description, is rather important uh, because, ironically, at this point, uh, with certain horror, uh, I recognize that I wrote about the siege in not all the genres imaginable, but many. I still did not try that aperietta, that vaudeville. And uh, by the way, uh, there were written in 1943 several vaudevilles about the siege in the city. And speaking about the genre characterization the texts of, that were written in the city about the siege, one can hardly imagine a genre that wasn't involved. Chistushki were written, comic little verse, uh, epic novels were written, texts for postcards were written, um, operas were written, libretti. So uh, to what extent this thing that everything so far as unrepresentable was actually represented is remarkable uh, and continues uh, amazing me. So I began writing this strange stuff that then uh, became Malinka Zelona Knyzhichka, which I must say uh, <laughs> I came to have some tender feelings for uh, for a number of reasons, uh, like one, especially if one is a Russian writer, uh, cannot help, uh, cannot resist loving a scandal. Right? As, um, also, I think Brodsky said in his um, notes on Dostoevsky, that Russian literature grows from a good scandal. Uh, so, so this knižichka was uh, expelled from a bookstore, from the biggest chain of bookstores in Petersburg. But uh, absolutely, basically, uh, people who expelled it never read this knižichka. This is important. This should be noted. So every time when I kind of entertain myself with thinking that I stand there with, in a long line with likes or like of Baudelaire, Flaubert and Joyce, people who were accused of pornography. Strictly speaking, I wasn't accused of pornography, unfortunately. Though God knows I would love to be accused of pornography. But it's not that easy, believe me. Who was accused of pornography is the author of the illustration on the cover. Indeed a remarkable writer and artist, Pavel Zaltzman, uh, who spent the whole winter and spring, otherwise known as Smirtna Para. Interestingly, it's a coinage that one finds a lot in the diaries. 
he, he was there in the city, he buried his parents, as many, many of uh, my and our protagonists. Buried means unburied, of course. Uh, means non-buried, non-buried. This whole thing about Astavila Mulushko, a prospect, they would just leave the uh, family in the streets. Uh, so uh, he was there, and then he managed miraculously to be evacuated to Almata, and there for the rest of his life he was creating this uh, wonderful. Um, strange depictions of what happened to him, what he saw during the siege. So when the book wasn't, pro when the Limbach Press uh, worked on his, uh, on the uh, idea of how this book should look, they asked, whom do you want on the cover? And I immediately said, Zaltzman. Uh, I am a huge admirer. And we did it, and we immediately <laughs> heard back from our audience, so to say. So this, you know, libellum, small book, is this non-poetry, strange essays or whatever they are, and a play, and a little play. And now this is a little bit, and, and then, since Kath already was in business of working with this material, she said, I asked, she said, I will try to work with this. So Polina doesn't like to call this prose. Um, it's really an interesting question, what is this genre? Um, and I'm not sure how to answer that question, but what I see her doing here is, uh, it's continuous with the poems that she wrote about the siege, in that I still think that a, a central problem is how you speak, or maybe a more precise way, not just how do you speak about the siege, but how does that experience of the siege work on your language? So, so going at it from a different direction. And I think a lot of her own, her own poetics has evolved under the influence of this um, challenged language of these people trying to speak about their historical experience. Um, in, the, in these essays, uh, I mean, maybe one thing that brings it closer to Rose is that there is a narrator. Um, I see her thinking a lot in these essays about the relation between her own discourse, her own language, and the language of the people she is representing. So working that distance, there's a paradoxical way in which she's more present in this prose, though indirectly, than in the poems because she's thinking hard about these other speakers and what her relation is to them and what her responsibility is to them. Um, and so I pulled out this one passage, not on, in the materials we handed out, I just wanted to read it, it's very short, where I hear something like that meditation taking place. What is my relation? to my subjects. In, in the white pink night, the river Fantanka flows like tomato juice from a broken jar in a puddle, when actually it's your hands covered in blood. And I, who up until this moment have accompanied you at a delicately maintained distance and with respectful aloofness, bow down to lick those idiotic, bloody, smashed, huge fingers. Fighting off drunken surprise, you sternly say, that doesn't give you the right to use the familiar. Now, we don't know who the you is. It's a surprise that she steps out of the text at this moment to speak in the first person, but I don't think it matters. 
what I see her doing here is imaging a relation to the historical victim, where that's your impulse. And, she, and as you've heard, her imagination and her writing is very physiological, very somatic. And so the way she depicts this moment of compassion and empathy is this lick, licking the injury. But then she imagines the person she's attending to saying, draw on the line. It doesn't give you the right. So this question of what right you have to sort of participate in their experience um, is something that she's working in really interesting ways in this prose. Um, to speak more precisely, and that's why we included this material on the handout, another thing that's going on here that's different from the poems is this, she doesn't have to turn around at the end of a line, verse, but she can keep going. And this is where the sin, matter of syntax comes in. Um, she it really can go to town with the sentence. And the syntax is very convoluted. And again, to me, it's part of this dynamic of struggle, struggle to talk. Um, now, Brodsky said you can't really bring that kind of con anguished convolution into English because the Americans are too untouched by trauma. Um, I don't think that's true, for one thing. Um, and I think uh, there, you know, what's happening currently in translation studies with a real emphasis on syntax and how important it is to try to stick close to syntax makes it feel not just possible but important to try to do that. So I tend to err on that side, especially in the first draft. I err on the side of sticking to her syntax even though it's a shocking encounter for a lot of English language readers. Um, there is a limit, of course, to how much you can do. And uh, I just brought in the very first page of one of the pieces in this book. It's a piece uh, about uh, Vitali. Vitali. Vitali Bianchi, who people in the room might, any might know yes. about. Yeah. So this is a test. <laughs> on many things, <laughs> and uh, so how old are you? Basically, <laughs> uh, how old you are and think right, um, Vitali Bianchi, and I tried to uh, translate Vitali Bianchi into American culture uh, with limited success. Um, every anthology of prose, every school textbook would include a text by Vitali Bianchi about nature. He was the specialist to go to uh, for writing about birds. First of all, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but ornithology, uh, but overall creatures. Uh, and uh, Bianchi was a part of our childhood in a rather special way. He just was there, like a chair or a table or a dusty window. I never met one person who had uh, feelings for Vitaly Bianchi. That person I never found, but also I never... I you have feelings. Anna, we absolutely will find out about your feelings. That might be the whole reason why I'm talking here now. Finally, there is a person who had feelings for Vitaly Bianchi. Um, you know, so sure. <laughs> right. So, um, and somewhere, right, in the little room with, you know, dusty toys and all this, he remained until the moment uh, within this very ending siege research when I came to find a diary by Vitaly Bianchi, the siege diary. Um, and again, seriously speaking, Bianchi, like to some extent Pustovsky, like to some extent Prishvin, 
uh, all this uh, and many uh, and a number of other figures uh, managed to f occupy this niche uh, within Soviet literature and Soviet literature for children, particularly where you feel somewhat protected from the Soviet fates or Soviet fata, if you wish, um, when you write about you know birds and all that. And so I found this diary, which completely um, surprised me by uh, impeccably, mercilessly, including to himself, understanding of what was happening in the city. Very, I would say, observant and very harsh readings of what he saw there. And that reader of the siege reality, somehow it was a big effort for me to connect him to that bard of Pianichka and Soika, all kinds of birds. And I guess that gave birth to some kind of process, which ended in writing this text which, by the way, includes some poetry. And it started as a poem, which is also curious. It's a text about two writers, Bianchi, mostly. But also, at some point, another writer walks into the text and has his moment there. Uh, the writers are Vitaly Bianchi and Evgeny Schwartz, uh, both, as I just said, as I call them, maybe somewhat frivolously, and this can be discussed, skazichniki, fairy tale writers. And indeed, Bianchi also developed this quasi genre of fairy tales about animals. And Schwartz wrote fairy tales, indeed. And Schwartz also uh, left an incredible siege text, Ambarna Kniga. Of course, not meant for publication, as we say, though it's a very problematic phrase. So, an essay about fairy tale writers, if you wish, who face the siege. Um, this is one way to describe it, and there are many, many other ways to describe it. So, if it's okay with you, if it's a good timing, I will read a little bit, commenting and explaining and kusochi. So I'll read from the beginning and then a little bit from the other part and then maybe we can start conversation about what is all this about. The text is called called Listadur. And also speaking of formal attributes, <laughs> it consists of many fragments, and each of them has a title. Где устраивают... Листодер. Где устраивают себе гнезда скворцы, для которых не хватило скворешин? Как январского ледяного лягушонка или новорожденного угря, я хочу увидеть его всего насквозь и навязать нам заново, хотя вряд ли мы, уж мы так особо обрадуемся этому заново обретению. Я намерена заглянуть внутрь машины по производству слов, машины под названием Бианки, и увидеть там до сих пор невиданное. Возможно, под влиянием его предположения, что именно невидимая, прячущаяся от нас жизнь, всегда увлекательнее, мощнее, сложнее того, что отдается равнодушному глазу, спешащему знанию. Мне утешительна мысль, что не то, что мы мним природа, не в отвлеченном смысле отвлеченного великого поэта, а в буквальном. 
поэта несостоявшегося, нелепого. А, поскольку я не читаю а, текст целиком, то тут стоит сказать, что в тексте приводятся стихи Бянки. А сейчас э, я прочитаю такой кусочек, чтобы дать вам понять на вкус под названием «Записки орнитолога». Зачем Виталий Бианки поехал в блокадный Ленинград? Как туда попал? Нам объясняют невнятно. То ли помочь едой ленинградским товарищам, то ли поискать еды у ленинградских товарищей. Обе версии удивляют. То ли посмотреть, то ли себя показать, то ли себя наказать по возвращении. Слег и лежал. Записи в дневнике так и показывают. 6 апреля лежал, 7 апреля лежал, 8 апреля лежал. Однако все увиденное, услышанное, хорошо записал и хорошо, то есть до самой смерти, спрятал. Берусь утверждать, что среди визитеров в блокаду натуралист-дилетант Бианки оказался писателем наиболее подходящим, чутким и методичным. То, на что смотреть было невозможно, осмотрел, категоризировал. При этом записки его, вполне опубликованные теперь, своего читателя, конечно, так и не нашли. Пронеслись очередным отвратительным залпом из 41-го, из тех, от которых, кажется, современники также пытаются увернуться, как их злосчастные предшественники пытались увернуться от снарядов на блокадных улицах, столь хорошо видных и известных немецкому летчику. Бианки, как неудавшийся, но все же ученый, распределил свои впечатления по феноменологическим рубрикам. Блокадный стиль, блокадный юмор, блокадное бесчувствие, блокадная улыбка, блокадный язык, вид блокадного города, блокадное женское и, наконец, блокадные евреи. То есть за две недели он понял то, что нам еще только предстоит сформулировать, что блокада есть особая цивилизация со всеми чертами, присущими человеческим сообществом. Улыбаются здесь так-то, торгуют здесь так-то, боятся здесь так-то, они а боятся вот так. Шутят здесь так и здесь, что любопытно и полезно для нашего скрипта. Вот, они встречаются. Бианки цитирует Шварца как одного из главных блокадных шутников. При том, что Шварца вынудили покинуть город в декабре, и мы можем заключить, что шутки его дотянули в городе до весны, не растаяли. Впрочем, в городе вообще ничего не таял. А, и еще немножко из следующей порции части она называется плиски птичий язык и э, Катя э, Кэтрин попросил меня почитать отсюда э, в, наверное как бы чтобы надеюсь что вы тут поймете какую муку она переживает это переводя плиски птичий язык Вернувшись из мертвого города, он отлежался, покоря был нечто в тайном своем дневничке, и опять принялся ходить в лес и там стоять, то с открытыми, то с закрытыми глазами, прислушиваясь, присматриваясь, всегда принюхиваясь. Мир, в котором обитает Бианки, нам чужд, слова его темны и тем манки, таким образом тревожит нас, и все же имеют к нам отношения. Цитата. В сырых кустарниках появились негрудые варакушки. И к 
пестрые чеканчики. На болотах золотистые плиски Прилетели розовогрудные жуланы С пышными воротничками Из перьев трухтаны появились Вернулись из дальних странствий Погоныш и дергач Зелено-голубые сизо-воронки Цитата закрывается Скажите мне, кто все эти твари? Что представляется вам в ходе предложения прилетели розовогрудные жуланы? Кто они? Совершенно очевидно, совершенно и очевидно, что автор их всех придумал. Перед нами иная, чужая планета, порождение фантазии человека, не придумавшего убедительных причин обитать на той же планете, где живем и мы. shamefully uh, for, forgot to say is that of course Polina is also a scholar of the topic of the siege <laughs> <laughs> that she also teaches at, at Hampshire College. 
She's also the editor, um, I have it in the back, but I can show it later to you if you'd like. She has just published an edited anthology of five siege poets, uh, the majority of whom are men. Uh, uh, like all, all, all of, of them, them right? total majority. Uh, which is uh, something quite contrary to what we have been discussing in class, but the thing is that this is perhaps not the canon of siege narrative, while uh, we have been reading the canon, and my question, which I'm in a sense rephrasing, my first question here is, uh, is it really so much about language, or and what do we mean by language when we are talking about translating such experience into whatever it is? To what extent do you feel that you are tran a translator yourself? Not of yourself, but yourself a translator of someone else's words, uh, which you convert into all these different genres that you are working with, whether it's poetry, prose, or non-poetry, or non-prose, uh, but Alina is also the author of a play which is very successful in Moscow and unfortunately it hasn't been translated into English yet so we will keep it for later but this is yet another genre uh, to talk about. So it's been not only written but also uh, staged. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then... Please. It's a very uh, difficult uh, question. Uh, um, Going back to something Catherine said, um, and believe me, this is a procedure of unease when somebody operates on your text right, right next to you. But everything about our craft is a procedure of unease. So, uh, th this question that Catherine discussed of um, relationship and responsibility. I'm going to, next week I'm going to Krasnoyarsk, uh, city in Siberia. There will be a huge uh, book fair. It's not the first time I go there. When I went a couple of years ago, when this book with Zhuvay Kartina, the first round of discussion was basically um, who are you to talk about this? Um, which was not the first time I was asked this, but uh, maybe it was the time when I kind of found it myself. To, it also I gave some uh, mumbling and uh, overly passionate interviews the question that uh, bless you that it's interesting that this is one of the topics when you have to pronounce um, your kind of relationship right what is your connection to the topic uh, and people ask you with some hope like were your grandfather and grandmother there? Did they die there? Maybe. Maybe that would give you some right. Uh, my grandfather and grandpa were not there. Uh, I absolutely do not see that in order to write about something or to work about something, uh, you have to have some kind of document. I understand that this is a very problematic, controversial topic. And there are many layers on which this topic is being discussed today in the United States and in Russia. Uh, I think in order to write about something, you have to want to write about something. Um, uh, why? Do I, why do you want? Huh? Why do you want? Why do I write? Uh, this is right. Why do I want to write about? Um, this is. Um, I don't know. It fulfills me. It fulfills me um, 
Sometimes I have this answer, sometimes another answer. Sometimes a critic comes up with the answer of some brilliant psychoanalysis. I think, yes, this is why I want to write about it. I think, no, this is completely silly. This is not. Um, sometimes around the play, there was this completely strange thing, right? Because uh, I, I, I wrote about, I, I'm coming to some kind of point, believe it or not, there will be meaning in this answer. So I went to Moscow and I saw this little play, Живые картины, Tableau Vivant, Living Pictures, on the stage, and I saw characters whom I, for the lack of the better word, put together, talking to each other, moving on the stage. And this was really striking and very unpleasant and amazing. Um, especially for the reason that usually I write using other people's words. This is problematic. No, everybody does. Um, problematic in uh, as in there is a problem to be discussed. Uh, I use Bianchi's diary and basically a lot of what you've just heard is montage out of Bianchi's writing. Uh, it's me, a woman in 2016, a courier between Amos, Massachusetts, Petersburg, and sometimes, I don't know, Krasnoyarsk, reading this material and writing about this material. So I guess the interesting question is how do we relate and how do we situate ourselves in relationship to words of this kind. Uh, in the play, it's uh, an affair, it's a play about love. Uh, it's also a play about uh, love to the Государственный музей Эрмитаж. Um, there are two characters, a художник и искусствоведша, an artist and an art critic. Um, she was a star of art criticism, if it's possible at all. I think it's a problematic coinage. Um, Tony Zergina, Antonina Zergina. His name was Moisei Vaxer. Uh, the most important artists and art historians of the moment thought that he would be the next NN, you name it. And since he died at the age of 25, and most of what he did disappeared. He never became the next MM. Uh, but it, it's an interesting and uh, interesting and interesting story. But we have some remains of the siege documents, letters, kusochki, vodnichka, fragments of his diary. So, for example, the play is built out of that. One can say, and again, since the genre nature of this has been widely discussed, uh, that I, I like calling this reconstructions, historical reconstructions. So when something, um, when you find, I am a failure um, philola classic. My first education is in classical uh, philology, so I can, fake little bit of that discourse. So if you find somewhere Naraskopi in a, a working archaeologically, it, like a marble piece of a finger, then what you do, then you sketch the whole hand. Um, you sketch what relationship it has to that little piece of finger that is thousand years old. Uh, question. We have like three pages of Macy's diary. I show in the text that this is the real thing. And everything else is my thing. Um, it is for a reader to decide whether he, she, they want to see the full sketch, whether they advergaird, you know, deny, um, reject. 
physics and biology, reject my reconstruction. Um, but I am into this business of reconstruction. Um, and another thing, of course, when I sat there in something that, uh, again, what is that thing that many, many, many times stronger than embarrassment? Um, observing on the stage, actually rather wonderful actors um, trying to uh, become these historical characters. Um, I thought that, well, if nothing else, <laughs> I tried in some endlessly strange way to bring what remains of them back to life for hour and a half. Um, I tried to amuse Moscow audience with the presence of Moisey Vaxer, whom people around him thought as one of the funniest young gentlemen of Leningrad. Um, for me, of course, there is a certain challenge to fight amnesia and to fight silence. That is another huge topic when we speak about the siege. Silence, lies, as I said, amnesia. Trying to give some other readings. But also what is very, very important for me, never insisting that what I do is truthful. Uh, I, 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 I do not like this conversation about historical truth. I see it as not extremely productive. But I like to, yeah, to, for a moment at least, to create some kind of possibility. Uh, to create some kind of, and here we go back to, to language. Since, and again, this, might be seen as problematic, and I can talk about this as well. I work mostly with the figures of language. People whom I represent here, uh, the writers. We have the texts, that's why I can do this, which doesn't mean that more than million of people who died in Leningrad without producing wonderful prose should not be represented. Um, but maybe other ways should be found. And the more ways would be probed is the merry. Little bit louder. Do you uh -huh. feel that giving voice to those people that were not just forgotten, but memory was repressed, that was, you know, uh, lied about in the Soviet Union, also like victims say in the Holocaust and the Balkans, that by giving that voice to them, uh, that uh, it's a part of some kind of healing process as well, because I think this kind of trauma affects several generations. Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. lies affect, you know, it's not, not just the victims but several generations of children of the victims and children of the perpetrators as well. Um, so, teachable moment. Since uh, Yasha uh, showed to the students, I think, wonderful documentary by a young Dutch woman, this is where it all becomes kind of curious, who can <coughs> research and think about the siege young uh, woman from Amsterdam comes to Petersburg several years ago uh, with actually a completely different topic, not the siege. But then she begins talking to people and understands that there is something she needs to think about. And she makes this film about relationship with the siege today, which is uh, very, very connected, but somewhat different topic than what I do directly in my research. So the main thing that we see in this documentary 
how nobody knows how to talk about it. it it's, and that she manages to register it in camera. This is remarkable, I think. Uh, for example, there is a moment when uh, an old lady, smart, sharp, difficult, and her husband are trying to talk to Jessica about the experience and to show photographs. Huma, as one understands, they didn't show to many people. Uh, and basically what is interesting about the photographs, which you, we also see, uh, they're shown to the camera for a moment, we see this woman 60 years earlier, uh, her dystrophic face for a moment. She is very, very, very thin. Yeah, I'm initiated, thank you. And then in that very room, there sits a son of this couple. It's one of those situations. And you know, there is, it's a Russian table, tortic, cake, tea, everything. Uh, and then the son looks at his mom and says, but you never told me you, uh, you were in the siege. Uh, and the parents begin kind of, well, you know, you never really ask. And then, after a, he, the son is in his, well, I would say 50s. Wow. Uh, and uh, then the son kind of makes a pause, takes a pause, and then the moment says, you know, actually, I never wanted to ask about it. I don't find it interesting. He is remarkable, wonderful enough to pronounce this. So then they sit in silence, parents and the son, he doesn't refuse the tea and the torture. Right, right. <laughs> he never refuses. He comes without tea and torture. Right, right. He is there torture for torture. No problem. So, and there they sit separated by this, separated by this conversation, and by this table, and Jessica doesn't switch the camera off. She shoots the silence that happens after this conversation that basically the only son never knew, one would argue, one of the formative experiences of his parents' life, that they survived. Uh, and I, I just find it uh, remarkable that we have a document of what Anna Halberstadt just said. We have a document of silence. To document silence, <laughs> one would think takes uh, wit. Uh, and of course I um, absolutely agree with you that as long as we, who is this we, um, we the Russians, as long as we uh, do not work on finding some kind of language of talking about events like this, of which there are dozens, uh, we would have precisely what we're having in Russia today, which comes not as surprising, upsetting, shocking, or unbelievable, but absolutely uh, predictable, and so on. And this whole hysteria, um, propaganda thing. Um, years ago, when I started working on the siege propaganda, and would talk to my friends about the siege Soviet propaganda. They were like slightly amused. But now, when um, it turns out that events of that war, events of that siege, events of these battles are being reused in the new propaganda, and the same devices are being used that were used then. Suddenly, uh, it becomes not only a question of some kind of dusty history. For example, so the first poem, Obe, it's the only initial that is recognized, more or less, because it's Birgold, Olga Fedorovna Birgold, the muse of the besieged in uh, the most, uh, the most popular, uh, poet of the topic. Uh, and the whole voice thing is about radio. 
right? So there is no newspapers with a couple of interesting exceptions to this story. Or nobody can get the newspapers. In order to get the newspaper, you have to walk to Nevsky. Where newspapers were uh, put on the special stand. But who can walk to Nevsky, right? It's like six hours one way from something like Narvska or Moskovska gates. Uh, so it's all about radio. And uh, Gergolz indeed basically daily reads her poetry or essays or comments. So she becomes the voice of the siege. Uh, and uh, again, what is interesting that now we are finding that uh, last year the, her diary was published and we find that uh, this triumphant voice of the future victory was endlessly more problematic and it's a hugely interesting topic but one thing I want to say that we also know now that there were two systems of broadcasting there was the siege broadcasted for Moscow and the big land and there was the siege broadcasted for Leningrad so one person like I, I kind of I'm really mesmerized imagining this so you write text about what happened in Leningrad today for somebody who sees that the city is covered with dead bodies and so on and so on and so on. And then you drink some hot water with sugar, smoke, and right there you would write a text about what happened in the city for Moscow, which was about number of tanks that 